Welcome everyone, welcome everyone. If you would be seated, grab your drinks and we'll get this party rolling. Um, on behalf of the Young Executive Committee and, and myself, the, and thank you all for coming tonight and to the first event of the Young Executives of the Commerce Club. <laughs> First off, I'm going to apologize. Sure. I have some talking notes here and I cannot see. I have some contact issues going on, so if I have to hold these notes up here, please just me for that. Um, and the guy that was supposed to be speaking tonight, Bill, <laughs> so. You're right. You're right. So work with me here. Um, when he gets a second, I'll part of, hand the, hand part of the mission, of, yeah, yeah, uh, the mission statement of the young executives is. Connect, create, and collaborate. Co excuse me, collaborate. Um, we want to connect young executives in the club. We want to create value through the enrichment um, process and collaborate with community partners. Um, I want to invite all of our guests. This table. Is this the table? Um, to, if you're a guest, to check out this table. It will tell you all the events that are going on in the club. Um, also, the young execs have multiple events coming up. Samantha over here that put me on the spot. She can probably speak <laughs> a little bit better about those events than I can. Uh, but I will say we do have some really, really amazing things coming up, and we encourage you all to come check those out. Um, also, if our members of the Commerce Club would please stand, if there are any in attendance. I encourage all of our guests to seek out any of these members or Samantha or any of the staff members. If you have any questions about the club, seek them out. It will be a great uh, resource for you. Um, and lastly, my job is to introduce our moderator tonight, Megan Prince. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over here. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that part. I didn't <laughs> she is an attorney with Hainsworth Central Boyd. Um, she serves as the president on the board for the Warehouse Theater, and she is also a professor at Furman University. So please help me in welcoming you, Megan. Well, oh, he ran for me. Can you all hear me? All right? Okay. okay. I brought my wine today because <laughs> this is breezy. Yes. It's a breezy Boozy. <laughs> so thank you, first of all, to the Young Exec um, panel for asking me to come moderate this discussion. I have to admit, I am not so savvy um, in the world of building my brand and personal um, brand and, and social media stuff. I sort of am somewhere in between my mother and my sister. My mother, I don't know what she's doing on Facebook, but y'all will probably all get a friend request from her later this evening. Um, my sister uh, informed me that if she doesn't get 100 likes in the first hour of any of her social media posts, she takes them down. Big mistake. Yeah, <laughs> she's clearly not an influencer. Um, so I'm super excited to be here with y'all and to learn more about what it means to have a personal brand. I don't really know what a personal brand is, so I'm also hoping to figure what that is tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, I'm going to start with Tarshish Jordan, who tells me she likes to be called Jordan, so I will be calling her Jordan. Um, Tarshish is the president. Sorry, I just called her Tarshish after I said <laughs> If you can say Tarshish. Yeah. Jordan is the president of Red Door Consulting. Um, Red Door is a boutique professional development company that guides organizations through the process of developing dynamic and highly functioning teams and leaders. Uh, drawing on her change management and scientific behavioral analysis expertise, Jordan helps her clients navigate complex change initiatives like defining corporate culture, reorganization, and improving workforce performance. Um, Jordan began her professional career in the healthcare industry as an IT specialist and later a business analyst in both the public and private sectors. Uh, in 2014, she was recognized by the London Image Institute as the most innovative presenter. 2017, she received the Excellence Award from the St. Laurent Community Care Center. We're very, very lucky to have her with oh us gosh. tonight. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Giovanni Calisi. 
Devani is an instructor of marketing at Anderson University. Uh, he's a doctoral candidate for the University of Liverpool in ABD status. I am looking forward to finding out what ABD status means. <laughs> I do not know. Um, he also has an MBA from the University of Rhode Island, a Bachelor of Arts in Communications, and another one in Film Studies from the Rhode Island College. Uh, he's a Six Sigma Green Belt certified, Google certified, and a scholar in digital integration. Uh, he's consulted for over 200 organizations, large and small. And a fun fact about Giovanni is that he was a fashion show producer as a side business for 10 years. Very impressive. Oh, fun. Side business. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> next we have uh, Mr. Damian Hall. Damian is an innovator in the luxury real estate arena. Uh, he's founded four successful businesses and multiple brands across the real estate field. In addition, he has helped to brand and market a multitude of startups and real estate professional for real estate professionals and firms across the country. He's consistently ranked as a top luxury broker with the Christie's International Real Estate Affiliates in the upstate and western North Carolina markets. Very impressive. And he has appeared on one of my favorite networks, HGTV. Uh, he's been quoted in USA Today, International Real Estate Publications, and Realtor.com, just to name a few. So oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next we <laughs> Amanda Phillips. Amanda is a former board certified counselor turned writer, speaker, and professional helper. Uh, her activism and philanthropy work for mental health, trauma, and abuse stems from her own journey of over overcoming those things. And she has built her own personal brand around heralding them rather than hiding them. Her professional goals range from normalizing mental illness to teaching current and aspiring entrepreneurs how to use their life stories to create a new niche in every field. So welcome, Amanda. <laughs> and finally, we have Ms. Leslie Haas. Leslie is a fifth generation Greenvillian. She began her career in the marketing industry and started her social media agency two years ago. Uh, Leslie Haas Social, which is the name of her agency, was the first purely social media agency in the state of South Carolina. Uh, Leslie currently serves on the board of Greenville Young Professionals, the Carolina Ballet Theater, and the Family Effect. She was recently named one of Greenville Business Magazine's <coughs> Best and Brightest, under 30, 35 and under. And she's a key influencer. She has over 10,000 Instagram followers and over 10,000 LinkedIn followers. Also, probably most importantly, she was my Leadership Greenville Class 43 classmate. Nice. And are there any Leadership Greenville alum in here? So obviously, the two of you know that Class 43 was the best class. So these are all our panelists. We're so excited to have them all here. And I wanted to start it off with a really basic question for this novice, and I'm gonna throw it to Giovanni. What is, yeah, because you're a professor. <laughs> what is a professional brand? What is a personal brand? What are these things? Sorry, I already taught all my classes today. <laughs> simple and to the point, right? All your brand is, what is that story that you want to convey to your target market? It's as simple as that. And when you make it more complicated, you really go down a path you really don't want to travel. So really all it is is think of your target audience. Who are they, what are their motivations, what do they want? Think of you, whether it's your business or you as a person. And what is that professional story or that personal story that you want to convey to them? And honestly, I'm gonna keep it as simple as that. That's a good answer. Does anyone else on the panel want to weigh in? Okay, so very well said. Can y'all hear me? Okay, I can hear myself now. Okay, um, your brand is simply the emotional response that someone has when they see you or when they think of you. So for instance, um, everyone think about Hershey bars. What do you think about? Crap. That's the brand. <laughs> crap, someone said crap. Um, most people like to think of um, childhood memories, making s'mores in the backyard. You think of that clean brown and silver packaging all of these things are their brand, simply. Um, the differences between a personal and professional brand, a brand, 
Um, I think we're seeing more and more in today's society that these are no longer separate entities. Whether you are a basically a solopreneur like myself, especially in Leslie House Social, it's me and a couple of interns who are amazing to couldn't be here tonight because they're working for me. Um, <coughs> or whether you are working for a gigantic company like Amazon, you take on the personal reputation of that professional company. Even um, job applicants now, every single person you apply to is checking your social media channels because that is your online reputation and that is your online brand. We're seeing college applicants become more and more competitive these days. So college kids and even high school kids have to have their own brand. What does your social media say? Do you have a website? What does your blog say? All of these things add up to your reputation, add up to what someone thinks about when they think of you, and, and that truly is your brand. <coughs> yeah. uh, I'll add to that and say, uh, everything I agree, both, uh, it tells your story, it, your personal and your professional brand are connected, but I'll also add that your personal brand sits on three pillars, mm -hmm. your appearance, your behavior, and your communication. Everything that you do, when you're the way you dress, the way you present yourself, um, your follow-up, the behavior, the way you communicate, both verbally and, and in writing, are your personal brand. That is your personal and your professional brand. And so I like to use the analogy. I'll say, uh, can you guys hear me? Because I'm going to move this. So if these are the three pillars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, appearance. I'm the helper now. Thank you. <laughs> appearance, behavior, and communication. Those are the pillars that your personal brand reside on, they lay there. Out of those three pillars, the one, what do you, which of those pillars do you think carries the most weight? Communication. It, that, that, you know what, that's some, that is actually the most essential one, okay. but it's your behavior, it is behavior. Follow up, do what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. When you are a young professional or a young executive, anyone, people will judge you based on you doing what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. The money is in the follow up. It, mm -hmm. Whether it is your business that you're promoting or you're advancing your career, the money is in the follow-up. Now, the smallest factor is appearance, believe it or not, but that is the thing that people see first. How, how many of you have heard of the seven-second rule? In seven seconds, people determine just by your, based on your appearance whether or not you're worthy of their time and money, if you're credible. Um, the communication, again, that is the one that's going to take you the furthest. So be be very concise in your communication, written or verbal, but follow up, doing again, I can't say it enough, being honest, operating with integrity, and doing what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it, that is your brand. Appearance, behavior, and communication, so. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I had other questions I was gonna ask, but that just made me think of a question. So. What I'm hearing is we have sort of an online social image that's conveyed, and then what Jordan was just talking about is what is the person behind that image, and what do they do? And I was wondering if any of the panelists wanted to talk about bridging those two different things, and, and, and how, do they, how are they related, and how are they two different prongs potentially to one broader issue? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Leslie. Take it. Um, <laughs> so as a social media influencer on the panel, like I, I feel like this is kind of in my area of expertise, I personally think that it's important and I work very, very hard to make sure mine are um, cohesive, to make sure that they are one <coughs> and the same. Um, I have a friend who is a very powerful female business owner and all of her marketing, she's really done up and beautiful and she never wears makeup a day in her life at the office. Constantly flaps, everything else. So I try to tell her you are setting people up to be disappointed when they meet you because you're not showing that you're congruent with your brand. So I work, for, I don't know how many of you follow me on social media and thank you for the ones that do and I hope that I'm providing good content for you. Um, and feel free to message me anytime as long as it's not creepy. Um, <laughs> but I work really hard to make sure that these are congruent um, because 90% of my 10,000 plus followers are in the upstate. I bump into people all the time. I don't want people to be disappointed when they meet me because I'm still human and I don't want to be a disappointment to people. 
Um, but so the, the, the vulnerability every once in a while, but the showcasing the strong female, that the sometimes I'm a mess, sometimes I'm the, well actually frequently I'm the type A that's running five minutes late for things, and then sometimes I actually show up early, beat y'all suckers here. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think it's super important that what you see is what you get as far as your online reputation because you're building trust in someone. So don't break that trust with your online persona as soon as you meet someone in person. Yep, yep, I, yep. I so add credibility. So she said it adds credibility. It absolutely does. If I, if you saw my title, if you saw my title and said it was an, a certified image consultant and I came in here in flip flops or I wasn't wearing <laughs> makeup, I think it would kill the credibility. So one of the things I like to tell clients, especially if I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching is um, virtual, uh, uh, Impact from the from the minute. Use that. Use that appearance. Use that right there to make the in, impact. Consistency. Be consistent at all times. Your virtual appearance, you know, virtual persona, I should say, should match your actual persona when you're out there. Make the impact. Make it consistent. And, and if not, you're going to lose credibility with people. They're going to think you're a facade. It, you're just you're fake, really. And be authentic. But be operate with the high at your highest level, and then just be consistent with that at all times. I think Amanda wanted to yeah, weigh in. And then just to piggyback off what you guys just said, I think it comes down to what your values are. Um, I had a business coach really early on um, in my entrepreneurial journey tell me that you have to have business values and then you have personal values. And some people can separate those. I can't because my brand is my whole life. Um, I used to be a therapist, I went through the mental health care cycle as someone who needed care, I saw a lot of gaps, I tried to go be a traditional professional, but I saw the gaps, so I couldn't do it, so I kind of pivoted and did my own thing. And so my number, my one and two personal and business values, because it's a catch-all for me, are authenticity and integrity. Know your personal truth and live by it. Mm -hmm. um, and like you guys said, do what you say you're gonna do, but then authenticity, uh, you know, if I'm a mental health advocate, I'm saying, I have a mental illness and, you know, uh, and here are the lived realities of it, but I'm putting this image out on social media, like I'm always together, and I'm always having a great day, and I'm always having a lot of fun. Sometimes I'm really depressed, and because I left the traditional field and left traditional authority, I have the freedom and luxury to be able to be so transparent and so authentic. Um, and that's not true for everybody, but who, like, who would I be if I'm promoting a brand of, if you struggle with this, you can be vulnerable about it, vulnerable about it and use that in your field to a degree, but if I'm not doing that myself, you know, that's an authenticity impasse. So I think it has to do with, you know, can you have the same uh, value set for your personal life and your business life? If you can separate them. I was talking to a friend of mine and I'm like, if I separated my Instagram accounts based on all the different things, so I do like Amanda the writer, Amanda the speaker, Amanda the personal trainer, my email signature would make your head spin. So that's why I'm a professional helper. I just make it all one thing and that's what you get. You know, today we're talking about mental health advocacy, today we're talking about this, today we're talking about this. Um, so I think it's just about living, like knowing what you believe and why you believe it and making sure that you're carrying that out in a way that is true to what you are advertising to other people. I, I, you bring up a really, uh, uh, something that I have been thinking about a lot bring, uh, coming to this panel is how, when I think of the term brand, I think of sort of, honestly, a curated image. And how do you infuse authenticity into that image? So Damien, I wanna, I wanna throw it to you for a second. Yeah. You're in the real estate world. And uh, you know, so you, you're, can you speak to how you authentically present yourself and market yourself at the same time in your industry? Yeah, and a little bit of that is piggybacking on Amanda's input about authenticity. It's also huge on the business side of things and not just on your personal brand, because if you're in business, in order for people to want to conduct business with you, to want to get to know you, they're going to have to know, like, and trust you in order to want to do a transaction with you. And that's whether or not they're coming into your small business to buy a product, whether they're giving you, you know, five minutes of the day to watch your video you've just put out. Um, and in my case, it's reaching out to me to help them buy or sell one of the biggest investments, uh, you know, in their life, which is their, their real estate. So it's, you know, my formula that I always go by is people, in order to know, like, and trust you, they want to see that authenticity piece. So they want to see, for me, it's posting pictures of me on the Swamp Rabbit with my adorable dog. 
So, you know, it's not just inundating people with, oh, check out my house for sale, check out this beautiful property for sale. You know, and a lot of that is calculated because we take such stunning photographs and video of our, our content that we're putting out there, our, in this, my case, is properties. So we're mixing a lot of that in with our, my life. So it's me, I'm an actual person, I'm approachable. I'm not just this person in an office somewhere putting out, check out this house, check out that house, buy this house, buy that house. You see me interacting in the community, I'm, I'm around, I'm out. So that sort of helps build up that likability piece. So people are beginning to know and like me in my ecosystem, I call it, which is you know all of social. Um, we have a pretty robust email database of over 10,000 people in our markets. So everybody's sort of getting a mixture of not just business, but a lot of my life. And again, if it has to be authentic, because otherwise, you know, people are going to look right through it and say, "Well, you're a phony, you're a fake," you know, you're what are you doing? Get out of here. Delete, you know, you lose their attention immediately. So I think and that in my case, from the business standpoint, I can also build trust on the flip side by I post our proof of success, I call it. So we have, when we sell a multi-million dollar property, we do it in a very classy, tactful way where we're not just going, sold this house, look at this, check this out, we're the best. But we're going, you know, we're, we have a video of that seller and this was the seller's challenge and this is why it took them a year with another broker to sell their house this is when we came in they were you know ready to be in arizona or wherever they were so over this process we came in we made it easy for them here's how we made it easy here's how we helped enhance the marketability of their property or their you know anybody else's case their product their service they're selling so we found the pain points with our clients and then we do videos we sort of tell their story so we are like you know okay one two three Elm Street, you know, in, on Augusta Road, sold. Well, here's Mr. and Ms. Smith. Here's what they had to do to get to, from putting a for sale sign in their yard to at the closing table. This wasn't just a transaction for us. This was us helping them get to that next chapter in their life that they were so eager to get to. And here's why we enjoyed helping them, you know, get there. So we sort of were able to post that success story in a manner that makes it interesting and not just salesy. So right. that builds the trust element of that know, like, and trust cycle. And from that, I mean, we get, I get probably three messages a day on social media from people that want to sell their house. So it's like, you know, from that aspect, we're not having to spend as much ad spend on marketing on other different avenues to bring in clients. Their, my motto is that we want to bring people to us. So we want people to engage with us, to trust us through the content we're putting out in order to Absolutely. say, hey, I want to work with that guy. Or, so you're infusing real stories into your marketing strategy. Right, yeah. You know, there, and so that brings with it a sense of authenticity because it's real. Right, yeah. yeah. And it's not anything that comes across as salesy or gimmicky, I mean, it's going to be ignored and disregarded. So Absolutely. you're going to get zero engagement on, on the different platforms. So that's a big, big yeah. deal. So I want to switch gears a little because I get the sense that we have um, – a lot of young professionals, but also maybe some new business owners in this room. Um, so I'm curious to hear from the panel, as a small business owner or a young professional, what would you say is the first step that I should take in creating my own brand? Pass to the boss. So when you start in your brand, whether it's as a person or a business, first thing you want to do is, who is your target audience? Who is that target market that you're going after? That's important. And it's important that you not only understand who it is, but you're able to define it. The question you want to ask is, why do they care, right? Because I can go out and I can start a business or I can take a ton of action, but if no one cares, I have a hobby, not a business, right? So you want to ask yourself, why does my target audience care? And here is a, a rule of thumb. I'm going to give you four possibilities that you can just think of. Now, I'm not saying this is every case, but this is about 90% of the case. Human nature, we have, you, you can say four motivations, all right? The first motivation is that need to belong, all right? Whether it's a belong to a family, to belong to a social group, to belong to a community. Disney, the company of Disney uses this motivation to, as the core of their brand. When you think of Disney, you think of family. So that, and they're doing that on purpose. So you wanna ask yourself, okay, do me as a person or does my business, do I bring people together? Do I make people belong in a community? Do I bring family together? That's one possibility. 
The next possibility is once you belong to a group, <coughs> we are all unique, we're all distinct. God made us that way quite beautifully, and we have a need to stand out and to be different. We all have certain accomplishments, we all have certain drives, we all have certain things we want to accomplish. So you want to ask yourself, is my brand a tool of self-expression? Okay, luxury brands are that. They're people wear a type of clothing because they want to express their personality. Does your brand help individuals express themselves, right? Or does your brand help people accomplish certain elements? It's that element of individuality. The third one is what we call altruistic, which really is a fancy word for meaning charity. Human nature, we are giving in our hearts, right? So are you a brand that helps people give to others? Are you a brand that helps the less fortunate? Are you a brand that helps people really in any situation? So that's the third motivation. The fourth motivation is curiosity. Curi now this is interesting. Curiosity is the gap of what we want to know and what we actually do know. And if there, and it sounds funny, but when you think about it, if there's something that we want to know but we don't know it, it drives us nuts, doesn't it? And we take action to find those results. That's why Google is so successful, right? Also news organizations, media organizations, they tease you, we call this clickbait, they tease you, say, hey listen, there's something that you really want to know out there, but you don't know it, haha, you gotta click in order for you to find out. So are you an organization that helps spark that curiosity? Now, you could be one of the four, you could be all of the four, but make sure, the first thing, have a crystal clear image. Who's that target audience I'm going after? Why do they care? Look at those four motivations I just presented and find out in line with your talents and your ability and your organization, which one of those motivations am I best fit to satisfy? Maybe one and maybe a couple, but in my opinion, I think that's a good first stop. So I have a stupid follow-up question. Um, <laughs> It sounds to me like you're talking about what does the content need to be for what I'm putting out into the universe. What are the platforms I need to be on? You know, do I need to call someone and get a logo designed first, and then do I need a Facebook account, and then do I need an Instagram, do I need Twitter too, and should I be on Snapchat also, and should I be messaging and live Facebook? Like, what are the in addition to the content, what are the nuts and bolts of putting together an, in, uh, an image? Anyone can take that, that, that's, that's hard, that's hard, yes sir. <laughs> um, that was a lot of questions. Um, it was one question, it was one question with yeah. lots of sub-questions. Okay, you, um, I mean, first and foremost, when you're talking about your brand and logo and things like that, I'll attack that first and then we'll talk about the individual platforms next. Um, so definitely need to have brand finish um, need to have your logo, need to have your colors, need to have consistency, need to have your brand voice, um, and need to Wait, have what's a brand, brand voice? Brand voice, like um, what sort of tone do you speak in? Is your are you speaking in a in a female tone? Are you speaking in a masculine male tone? Are you a brand that uses emojis? Do we curse in our captions or or in our content? Um, all of these things are really important, and and that's one of the the things that I do for a lot of small business clients because they're usually all over the place. So I help them identify a brand voice and put it all in one neat little package and then say, here, follow this, and then you can't mess up. Well, you can, but it makes it easier. Um, and then as far as all the platforms go, um, Facebook is still absolutely the largest platform of them all. One out of every five minutes spent online anywhere in the world is on Facebook. Um, it is the number three search engine behind Google and YouTube. So um, it, it has its pros and cons. So there are also three times more business accounts than there are personal accounts on Facebook. But it's also the cheapest, literally the most cost-effective digital dollar that money can buy. So a really, really great place to be running ads. Come, I see so, people taking so notes. This is oh. awesome. Like, so question though, look, wait real quick. Didn't Facebook change its algorithm and like did that have any effect? The algorithms change constantly. Okay. Constantly. So all of the, uh, and I'll just explain this really quick. So the algorithms are basically a giant math equation that every platform uses to try and figure out what you want to see. So every single social media platform, their job, literally how they make money and how they pay their employees is to keep you on the platform and on your feed for as long as possible. 
because the longer you're on your feed, the more ads that they can serve you means the more money that they are making. So they literally have teams of thousands of people that try and figure out human behavior and then map algorithms around that in order to show you only the content that you want to see so you'll be super engaged so that you will spend more time on the platform. This is really similar for other like web and digital geeks. I'm totally going to geek out here for a minute. Um, I'm a nerd. I just look like this. Um, <laughs> yes, you can laugh. It's okay. Um, so very similar to um, the, the Google SEO um, algorithm. Difference is Google does one major update a year, possibly two, and for the most part they publish their list or you can get a hold of it. So what happened was, and then all the other algorithm, all the other platforms got smarter and figured this out, was that since Google lists their list of what they're grading your website down, which is how by which you fix all of these things and that's how you organically rise to the top of, of a list. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if someone is, is Googling um, Greenville, South Carolina Realtors, if Damien has the best website that's getting a lot of hits that meets all of this algorithm criteria, then his website will automatically, automatically go to the top. That's Google SEO in a nutshell for everyone that I'm geeking out on. Um, so because of this, we had Google SEO firms pop up all over, over the country. This is money that Google is missing, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so Facebook, Instagram, and all these other social media platforms got smarter. They don't let go of their list. So the average layperson who's not an expert like me who spends ridiculous amounts of hours researching this and connecting with other professionals across the country, um, you have to pay for ads. So they get to keep your dollar. Mm -hmm. So so that's, so sorry, that was a really long <laughs> answer to a really short It was good, question. it was good. But yes, yeah, short answer is the algorithms are constantly changing because human behavior and trends are constantly changing. So these companies are really smart and they have really big teams of very, very smart people who are trying to keep you on their platforms for as long as possible so that they can make more money off of you. Good answer, Jordan. You want to weigh in? Yeah, it's not a big deal. I definitely can't. I'm learning from you. When it comes to social media. <laughs> Lots of free content. Yes. Back to, you said, um, what should a new or aspiring yes. entrepreneur do? Yes, weigh in on that. Yeah, yes. Giovanni's, uh, I took notes when he was speaking as well, but I also want to tell you guys, um, the first thing you want to do is, if for those of you that don't know what the product and service is that you want to offer to your clients, you want think about what you're passionate about. Think about, and I mean, you hear it all the time. Think about what you would do for free. Think about what people compliment you on. Think, I mean, literally, think about that. There's something that you do extremely well, like no one else does. That is your product or service. So that's step number one. If you don't already have your product or service defined. Now, once you have it defined, or if you already know what it is, then the next step is look at your competitors. That's the next step. Look and see what they're doing, and you do it better. Differentiate yourself from your competitors. Make sure that you outserve them, outshine them in every way. Really spend some time becoming an expert at that. And then the thing that has served me well, that has served me the best when it comes <coughs> to getting contracts from my company, it has been building relationships. First, I had to do the hard work of knowing who I was. Um, what the statement I was going to say uh, earlier was visual impact and consistency. That's my model. That's the thing that I tell people. I am who I say I am, and you're going to see the same thing at each time. Uh, each time, I know what I do. I know what I do well. I try to bring that same thing at all times. Um, but you, you, you just what you're passionate about. That, that is it. You know, and then those relationships. That was the thing I was going to say. Relationships. My re relationships have opened doors for me. People, because they see that I do what I do well, they know that they can count on me then I can go to a friend, or I can call, uh, I was here once and say, hey, you know, um, would you be willing to let me come back and do some training sessions there? So build on those relationships. Know what you're gonna do, know, I mean, know, I mean, be able to go three answers deep in your domain of knowledge. No one in this room should be out able to outshine you when it comes to the products and services that you offer. Um, and, and then build on those relationships. You'd be surprised at what people will do for you um, when they see that you're really passionate about what you do. That is the thing that helped me as a small business owner. Absolutely. I, I want to get Damien and Amanda's thoughts on this too. And I would also like when you answer to talk about 
what you do locally in Greenville, what kind of events are you going to, who are you networking with, who needs to be in the room when you're building these relationships, but answer any questions you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take it right back to the previous second real quick and then we'll, we'll move on to that. Um, so I think when it comes to just tying a bow on what all three of them were, the knowledge they were giving, it's, it's a culture. So when you're redeveloping your brand or when you're coming up with a new brand, you, everything, all the advice that they have given ties into your culture. So you want to be thinking about who your clientele is, who your target demographic is going to be, what drives you, what, you know, what nonprofits or um, what do you support as far as on the charity. charity. Uh, that all is your culture. So once you kind of have an idea in your head what you want your culture to look like, then you can help define what your logo and what your the rest of it, how that's going to follow. And I think going real basic level, uh, if you're just starting your brand or if you're looking to recreate it, your logo is the first thing that everybody sees when they see your business anywhere. I mean, that's going to be, you're going to spend good money putting your logo all over the place and hopefully put a lot of thought into where it is and what that's tied into and does that match your culture. But your logo needs to be, that's your first impression. So don't, for God's sake, don't go on Fiverr and pay $5 for somebody to make a clip art logo. I see that day, especially, maybe more so in the real estate world. <laughs> ah, sorry, sorry, thanks. So uh, Fiverr, if you don't know, it's a great resource for a lot of marketing things, but in my opinion, not Logos. So you can go on, it's basically crowdsourced, and you, anything you need from getting a video design to flyers made, brochures, I mean, there's literally people that will walk around town with your logo tattooed on their forehead. So it's... It's online marketing freelancers. Yeah, for... Five yeah. dollars. So it's five dollars and up for different gigs, and then, you know, you basically get what you pay for with these things. So. In this day and age, I think there have been a lot of other companies that have sort of topped them as far as quality. You can go to Taylor Brands is one that I like for that I've used a few times. Um, Upwork. Yeah, Upwork, 99 Designs. So fork out a little bit more money and thought on your logo than just going to, you know, basically the, the Walmart of the internet for, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, love Walmart, yeah. Um, Wait, let me shift, let me shift nice. back to what you did <laughs> locally. What, I mean, when you were first starting out, and all of you, and I want to get to Amanda too, um, but what did you do locally? What, were you going to a bunch of events? Were you giving your business card to everyone you met on the street? I mean, what is sort of your origin around that? I was sort of the opposite. So I didn't, I kind of got burned out from the networking events and all of that. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, when you're just getting started, there's so many, especially now that are going on and they're, they're a great resource. But for me, I'm more of the creative type. So I enjoyed being, you know, on my laptop and coming up with uh, basically developing my brands, so developing the culture, the Facebook pages behind Damien Hall Group, you know, Damien Hall Group Equestrian, or like, like Kiwi. Uh, so it's basically figuring out where I wanted to go in the direction and then painting a beautiful picture about it. And was it that product that helped you gain momentum? What was the sort of the change? The yeah, I would say a majority of it. I mean, I worked social media very hard and everything I put out was absolutely perfect. So, I mean, not... <laughs> I know, right? Sorry, it's been a long day. Not, not perfect and like, you know, it, 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 other people judging me, but like... But you were careful. You were careful about what you put out. Leslie's going to be giving me a grade later, so we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> but in my own eyes, you know, anything that was half-assed or didn't meet my, you know, sort of my own standard didn't cut the grade, you know, as far as what I wanted to put out. So uh, another big thing that really worked well for me in the beginning was we started out with videos. So we started out shooting these really sexy high-end videos for these properties. And, you know, most people weren't doing it. I was the first one in this market to really bring like that elegant yet cutting edge video that people were going to want to engage with and wasn't going to bore them to death. And we could try and get our audience on social to interact and engage with them and not click away in 30 seconds. Um, you provided something unique to the market. Yeah, yeah, and basically yeah. just every, like real pretty visual, you know, content. I guess authentic, good content, not Absolutely. just, you know, run-of-the-mill stuff that isn't going to get attention. Absolutely. So. I mean, I 
Amanda, do you want to I'll gladly give this away. Yeah, <laughs> take the pressure off of anybody who wandered into the business world on complete accident like I did. Um, so I was in a very structured environment and took a pivot. Um, I guess don't feel like this has to, like, I, I don't know, I don't think any of you woke up and I didn't wake up being like, I think tomorrow I'm going to go be a mental health advocate and use my entire life story and go like lobby public policy and get up on stages and speak and have this blog. Like, I didn't know that I was a writer until like five years after I had started a blog already. So there are very likely things that you're doing organically in your life or in your niche as it exists now that are gonna, in five years, maybe be something that you use to pivot and set yourself apart in your industry. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, when I was in these, you know, when I was in these seats being like, how am I ever gonna, no, 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 it just kinda, it just kinda happened in it organically because I was doing things that were authentic and true to my message already. And you're probably already doing that, so like, if. I don't know, I heard all that and was like, I didn't know what those words meant a year ago, and <laughs> here we are. So um, that and I guess just kind of, I, I, don't, I don't really follow, I love all the work that you do, but I, I have not always followed the mold because I think when, when you want to innovate something uh, and you're going to just kind of stick your neck out, you're going to get access thrown at you. Um, so just kind of sign away on that mm -hmm. before you go. And I think all of you have, have faced that because you are very outspoken individuals as well. Uh, for example, I woke up and I was like, I'm going to be a writer, a traditional writer who writes books. So I went to a book con a writer's conference and I submitted a book proposal and it got rejected. So I was like, well, I guess I can't be a writer. It was no, the audience that I was pitching my work to wasn't served by my message. So it's like, you're going to get rejected a hundred times and you're going to feel like you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so I think all those are very important cues that you actually do know what you're doing because the truth behind that is not that you don't know what you're doing, you're just doing something that hasn't been done before. So like when I was in preschool, I was cast in a church play uh, as an angel, obviously. Um, and I had a <laughs> solo, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I had a solo and I can't sing, but nobody knew that because I was three, you know what I mean? So I'm up there with the halo and have a microphone um, and I start singing and it just didn't go well so I got demoted to being a sheep. That was a time when I didn't know what I was doing. You know what I mean? So like, try to analyze redirects like that as, is the product I'm putting out something that I need to develop further? Or is it just something that's kind of cultural and hasn't been done before? So someone going to grad school to be a therapist and then getting credentialed as a therapist and then saying, I don't think I want to do it the way that all the other therapists do it. I actually want to abandon that shingle and become a life coach and use my life story. Like everyone's like, you can't do that. I got very attacked. Uh, when I launched myself as, you know, a, a person with a mental illness who was going to go lobby and be a consultant and stuff. Someone actually DM'd me uh, and was like, when did you take, uh, on my email signature, so I'm a national board certified counselor. And someone DM'd me and they were like, well, when did you take the MDCC, which is the exam? I'm like, in 2014, how can I help you? Like, what do you, what do, what, what do you want to take the certificate? Um, and she's like, well, I looked you up on the database and like you didn't come up. I'm like, well, it's because I'm not taking active referrals because I'm transitioning. You know what I mean? Like people will throw axes at you uh, for innovating in your field. Let them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, I think that's actually an indicator that you're doing things that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and maybe, I don't want to like say like, if you're not getting access to it, you're not doing it right. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really want to. You're talking about you get the name you are. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So brand relevance, as Leslie would probably interpret that. Mm -hmm. And if you put yourself uh, out there, you're going to get open to, you're opening yourself automatically to yeah, everybody. Yeah, you're going to get criticized, but then I guess to answer the local question. No, you don't have it. Maybe oh, I mean, well, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> locally, I, I hate, I, like the book proposal thing, which really made me hate traditional networking. They're like, you need to have a bigger platform. I'm like, that feels really insulting, so I'm just going to go make a bunch of friends. Interpret it however you need to, uh, you know what I mean? But I actually joined up here and found a mentor, and I found people who were like, we really wish that when we were your age, I'm 28, so I'm they're like, we really wish that we had done this. There are going to be people who will, will help you uh, along the way and hire a coach if you need to. A, a traditional coach was a good fit for me, but it's like if someone was like, I mean, I need you to help me with social media. I'm going to be like, cool, I think I'm from Leslie. Yeah. Like, you don't <laughs> have to be able to figure out everything. You don't have to be able to do it all. Um, I self-taught myself what was appropriate, um, like cute little graphic design stuff in Canva. But if you ask me to do like a full-on, like, rebrand my social media, I'm gonna be like, and here's Leslie's email, or like teach me about conventional marketing tactics. I'm gonna be like, uh, here's Giovanni's contact information. Like you don't have to be the know-it-all. Um, and so that's kind of why I like the local aspect. It's like, we're in, a, like in our community, I don't know anybody at this table who hasn't benefited from a mentor in this yeah. community. Like you don't have to like 
refer out to New York and get some like big know-it-all master class deal. Like it's all kind of right here. And do you feel like that follows you? Like you refer someone to Leslie, she refers someone to you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, like that think, stays, that becomes almost part of your brand? I don't think so, because I think that if you're known for collaboration, that's always just gonna be paid forward back to you, rather than, uh, you know, I don't I don't really associate any uh, thing about Greenville with being a Sharpie or competitive or whatever. I think our community is known for being collaborative. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think that's the kindness in the air that you feel here and that we're not all out, of, out to get each other. Um, so I think, you know, that's after, if someone's like, Leslie, I need life coaching, she's gonna be like, have you met Amanda? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, yeah, and that's why I like, yeah, like I don't wanna hear your problems, like those, those things. <laughs> <laughs> I love that sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so that, sort of what you're talking about leads into my next question. Um, what do you do if you feel like your brand has been damaged. Um, maybe you did something that doesn't comport with your brand. Maybe there's a false story out there about you. And Giovanni, I would love for you to take this question. Sure. I was, I'm gonna mention two types of friends that we all have. The first type of friend is so self-centered and me focused, you can only handle them five minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. They're always talking about the newest thing they bought, and what they did, and I did this, and me, 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 and always trying to put other people down, and always try to make them seem better, okay? Sometimes your brand, whether you know it or not, and this is actually a common mistake, you don't need to do it. But one question you might want to ask yourself if your brand is damaged or if it's not working, is my brand too me focused? Mm -hmm. Am I that conceited friend that is just me, 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 always putting myself above others and putting others down? Then we have another type of friend. And that type of friend is the most fantastic storyteller. It's like Walt Disney reincarnated here in your friendship, okay? They are talking about themselves. They are talking about what they're doing, but it's not really me-centered. They're telling a story. They are real. They are authentic. They take pictures of them and their dog as they walk in the trail, <laughs> right? They are humanized. That is what you want to do. So whether it is that your brand is not working or that your brand has been damaged, go back to basics. Tell your story as a storyteller. Be human, be real, be authentic. Because nothing can correct a damaged brand better than authenticity. Am I right, guys? Absolutely. Okay? Because you know what? Everyone makes mistakes. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone has flaws and everyone does things that they wish they could backtrack. Yeah. We understand that because we've been there. You know what? As long as it's a moderate mistake, we understand when other people do it too, as long as they're authentic and real about it. So that if your brain is not working and if you realize that, uh oh, I did a boo boo, right? Listen, s stop with the phony, you know, mirror image. I gotta tint my windows and have some kind of fake pizzazz that goes out there. Mm -hmm. Just be real, be authentic. Go back to telling your story. Be that Walt Disney friend that can honestly be real and tell a human story. Jordan's nodding her head. I feel like she should weigh in. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, yeah, I, I, call them, I, I call them brand blunders. When yeah. you've had a brand blunder, said, retell your story. You can always, I tell my kids on a regular basis, hit the reset button. Hit the reset button, start over, and just tell your story the way it, you want to be seen out there. Just the, the way you want to project and present yourself just hit the reset button and start all over. And whenever it's needed, actually apologize. Mm -hmm. If you know that your brand blunder um, may have offended someone, take the time, be authentic, and apologize. And say, that wasn't uh, the person that I want you to see. That wasn't the side of me that I want you to see. I've learned from that mistake reset and start all over. Just put put it out there the way you want it to be. And a brand blunder can be anything from a social media, we should all sit politics, it, you put something out there mm -hmm. and later you thought, I shouldn't have put that out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that exactly. gives me another thought. Delete it um, and, and, and or apologize about it. But then a brand blunder can also be for women, you know, uh, uh, wearing something to work that is different than the way you normally want to present yourself. And I would say women are men, you know? Um, and, and in the meeting, everyone's like, mm, 
oh, that skirt was a little short today, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you feel like, why did I wear that? You know, just re hit the reset button. I mean, really, it can be that serious or that, that minor. You can always hit the reset button and start all over again. And whenever needed, be, keep it real. And, well, and apologize. <laughs> Which way? Good. Okay, and there are three steps to an effective apology. I actually learned this from shit like the therapy. So um, apologize quickly. Mm -hmm. Don't let too much time go by. Apologize fully which means apologize for all of it. Everything that you did, not just part of it. Just did this last week. And then take full ownership. Yes. So yeah, y'all write this down. <laughs> yeah. Quickly apologize fully, take full ownership. So the, the last one means don't apologize for 75% of it and then say, but you did this. That's not an apology. That's shifting blame for that 25% that you're not owning up to. So use this in your personal life. Use it in your business life. Use it every day of your life. It's really effective. And, well, real quick, uh, Jordan just brought back something. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you are a small business owner, if you're starting a, a business, your personal brand, people are going to look you up when they go to research your business or your brand. So don't be on Facebook blasting Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or one side or the other because you. It's part of your brand. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but for most people, unless you're in, <laughs> yeah, in some way, yeah, uh, yeah because you've just alienated 50% of your Absolutely. your client and customer base. So I see people do that all the time, and they're like, "Well, you know, we're not getting the business we need, or this and that." I'm like. Because I have to bail out, of, I, I can't deal with your Facebook page, you're, you know, getting in a fight with your followers and your friends, and I mean, just putting all that out there on blast, and it's just, it's not good for your brand, and it's not good for your image. Yeah, absolutely. Politics and religion, if you don't exactly. want to be, yeah, you unless are cutting yourself, yeah, exactly, <laughs> unless it's part of your brand, you are killing yourself. Um, we, do we have questions in this audience? Yes, I'm going to take this. There you go. And, yeah, we'll start right here. Oh, sorry, I asked it. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Delisha Ivins. Um, and I have a question actually. You were talking about throwing axes, and so uh, I, I do marketing, I actually do content marketing for real estate. Um, one of my questions was um, with regards to the 40 40 20 rule, which uh, is like 40% is your offer, 40% is your market, and 20% is your copy and your, your image mm -hmm. that you're going to put that ahead. Um, you're talking about having an offer or having a message and that if it gets struck down, maybe to keep pursuing it. So, and I, I agree with that, but I think to a space, um, when I did testing for my market, uh, I found that it wasn't so much the market, it was the message. And so if I twisted or tweaked the message a little <coughs> bit, like you can kind of hone in and target that and line that up. And so I think if you're really, really close, like maybe you could kind of talk a little bit about that. Like, like how did you come to honing in and finding that this was your message and this is your market and okay. lining it all up? Okay. Yeah. You want to take that? Go ahead. Stand up for the place. Yes. Yeah. Work okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think you're talking about maybe message integrity, message clarity. It's so trial and error. Uh, when I first started uh, in <laughs> the business world, I guess I was a writer and I wrote about things uh, for a very conservative audience that weren't very conservative. And that didn't go well uh, for reasons that I had to find out the hard way. Um, so I think with, I think of business and art maybe in the same vein this way, it's if you're putting something out there, uh, something out and it is not resonating with people, it's either because you're talking to the wrong people or because you maybe need to develop it a bit further. So that's how I found, like my first book proposal got rejected. And so it wasn't, I'm not a good writer. It was on these people that I'm trying to speak to really don't have a need for what I'm trying to say. Um, so I actually, uh, so I'm not really in a traditional, uh, basically I, uh, my spark note story is that I couldn't really fit in well with the job that I had. So I invented my own job. So I don't know if one of you wants to piggyback off what this would be like in a, right? Like what a luxury. Uh, but also like living in the red for five years. So you know what I mean? Like give take, but I don't know if one of you wants to piggyback off what that is like in maybe a more structured environment. Um, whereas I had the freedom to kind of take a walk back and uh, I feel like writing is very different than a, a business product. Because yes, I'm telling a story, but it's about my life. Um, so if I'm writing a memoir, it's not so much you know, is the product false? It's how am I going to deliver that to the right market? So does maybe one of you <coughs> think about, and maybe a more like more rules environment? Yeah, you have to stand to them. 
<laughs> Stretch. Like Stretch. Elaborate on like testing to find yeah. your market. To your market. Okay. So you actually bring up a good point because this is what's going to happen is sometimes you can do all the research that you want. You can have the best target audience defined. You release it and then you realize it's not working. Okay. Um, that happens more than you know. Even Fortune 500 companies, even marketing agencies in Madison Avenue, they do this on a regular basis, right? A lot of times you hear the phrase, which is very popular right now, A-B testing, right? right? Right now it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way to Z testing. And really what that does is, in today's digital environment, we actually have the luxury to actually release different messages simultaneously and find out what works. Like for example, Leslie was talking about um, Facebook advertising and Facebook on Instagram, so the Instagram advertising. I can actually release my same message position in five different times to five different audiences and see what one clicks. We can actually use the same budget, the same time, the same exact scenario, and that can actually help you where you can realize, okay, well, if I word it this way and if I go towards this audience, wow, well, this actually seems like it's working, okay? Or another one was not working. So a lot of it is trial and error. Now, I can get really technical. Like, I love when Leslie said that she's a technical geek, because I am too. Yay! But, <laughs> trust me, I, I'll go on forever. If anyone wants to get technical, see me afterwards, and I'll be happy to go over this in more detail with you. But I will just start at, it, it can be trial and error, but the good thing is, is with the digital capabilities that we have today, it makes it much easier. And if you want to learn more about it, please see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, this is good, though. Jump over here and come back. <clears throat> so earlier you mentioned altruism. What if your market is altruism? So I work in the nonprofit field. Mm -hmm. One of the few things that is guarded more closely than a client base is your heart song, essentially. What you believe in, who you support. I can tell her about my nonprofit all day long. Her heart is full. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is get my name in the ring and see if I can become something that they are even willing to consider caring about. How do you penetrate that market without running the risk of offending the senses of someone that you're trying to show what you're about? So for example, what I do and how I do it, and who I market to, how do I get them to hear about who I help without making them feel like I'm challenging where they're already directing their assistance? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you, do you have a specific person you want to answer that? <laughs> Fire away. Okay. Um, well, I can touch on that and then touch on your last question again all at the same time. Um, because the 40, 80, what, it's bullshit. Right. It's, yeah, it's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, content creation is everything. And this, this goes for both of your questions. Um, if you aren't creating cool content that gives value, that people, are, uh, that people are interested in following, that people want to attach themselves to, no matter how much testing or how much planning or how much you do, it's not going to work. So I, I tend to take the non-traditional, where Amanda and I were non-traditional. So I tend to take the non-traditional, more creative approach when it comes to the marketing campaigns that way. And, and clearly it's something that's worked in my niche. Um, and, to tell, and to touch on your point, you have to tell a compelling story. You have to tell it in a non-offensive, wide appealing way, or to touch on what this genius over here, Giovanni, said earlier, figure out who your target demographic is first, how to speak to them, what do they respond to, where do they hang out, are they on Facebook, are they on Twitter, are they at these bullshit networking events that I'm not very good at, y'all. Um, and start with the end result that you want to have and work backwards from there. It doesn't really make sense to start pulling together a formula and then try and push it down. So start with your end result, create cool content. And, and um, engagement is literally the number one indicator for how organically, how widely organically a post is going to be shown without ad spend. So that is like what your the big mistake that your sister's making. If she's she thinks that if she's not getting enough, um, and she's kind of right here, but she's wrong in, in deleting the post. Um, the first hour that your post is shown, all of the social media platforms grade your post on how quickly it is being um, engaged with and how, how much that's going on. So are people liking, are people commenting, are people sharing? So again, we're gonna start with the end result in mind. We want to have that engagement. 
what kind, as a content creator and as a, as a nonprofit, <coughs> what kind of content can you create that's going to capture that engagement? And that's the million dollar question you need to answer. And video is probably more prevalent right now than anything. Would you agree? It depends, so if you it depends on the platform and it depends on the audience. Um, there are a lot of statistics to, that say that um, it doesn't work across the board. Mm -hmm. My videos do pretty poorly on, on my own social media, but I think that's because a lot of my audience are 25 and over. They have jobs. They might be scrolling through mm -hmm. social media while they're on their phone, so they're not <coughs> listening to video. Yeah, I've so, seen that. And so I, I've noticed that with my stories as well. <coughs> so that goes back to Gianni's point of then, once you kind of have a lot of this honed down, get the data. Do A-B testing, see what's working, see what's not, work smarter, not harder. Facebook, Instagram, they all give you the analytics. All you have to do is look for it. Amanda, do you want to weigh in on the nonprofit piece? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, and maybe to get some clarity for you, as far as like the nonprofit world, I like to talk about heart capital. Because in the nonprofit world, maybe we're not dealing with people who have very liquid revenue or, or whatever, but a, a lot of that to me is you have a story to tell that you're really passionate about that might be polarizing for some people. Like I didn't wake up and I'm like, I'm going to be a mental health advocate because people are like very, very lukewarm about that. Like people are either very militant or they have no understanding. So, uh, and I didn't choose that path because it just sounded cool. I, choose it, I chose it because I went through it and I know the hurdles and I know the battles intimately and I know what the pharmaceutical companies will do and I know what this is like. Uh, my guess is that you're in whatever, no matter if it's nonprofit or not, that you are pursuing whatever you're pursuing because you have a heart capital investment in it. And so our job uh, in, in marketing and business and whatever is to, to convey why we made that investment to other people to invite understanding and invite them to make the same investment. And the first part has to go first because as I'm pitching to you that I want you to support you know, my American Foundation for Suicide Prevention overnight walk and I talk to you in this businessy language and you're like, suicide, yes, I don't wanna talk about that. But I tell you my story about how I overcame that and why it's important to me and about how I believe if, you know what I mean? Like if you if you put the narrative behind it, you put the authenticity <coughs> behind it, it tends to disarm any of uh, these heightened uh, mobilizations and armaments that people uh, tend to bring up, whether it's nonprofit work or not. Like there's politics and everything, but there's also a way that you can tell your story that will invite people into understanding it and understanding your territory and why you're inviting them into your territory rather than uh, lobbying for space. So really different. Because you can come in with guns blazing and maybe that might not speak to people, but if you come in, uh, my personal story, I tell it because I know that I didn't understand it before I went through it. And so I feel like my job as an entrepreneur is to use my platform to tell it so that people can gain understanding into that territory. But I think it's true for non for for profit marketing, for real estate. There's this reason that he got into the real estate industry and that reads in his, in his marketing and in his social media. Uh, so I, I don't know if that answered what you were asking. Um, somewhat, the, the, the larger portion of the problem that we're running into, uh, one, it, it's kind of a two-part, one is budget. Yeah. In a lot of circumstances, most nonprofits, when you're, if you're, you're either a small nonprofit or a big nonprofit, yeah. and unless you're in nonprofit, you don't understand that difference. Yeah. It's the difference mm -hmm. between a $100,000 nonprofit and a $1.8 million yeah. nonprofit. Yeah. And I would be happy to spearhead being in the middle. But when I talk to someone and I try to get them to understand, I'm not trying to take away from what you already care about. Right. I'm trying to see if this is something else that you can be attached to as well. Mm -hmm. How do you open that door without making someone feel like you're only trying to take away from what they're already Excellent. given? Um, the quick answer that I'm gonna pass to Mike is probably uh, when I found intersections with uh, work that I want to do maybe in that same vein is I try to identify what their goals are and uh, you know say like I know that you're seeking XYZ and the work that we're doing over here coincides here and why don't I pitch look at this you know you make a pitch based on that rather and I, I mean you, you seem like you have a wherewithal that you're not just making a blind pitch here's what I want just m making it tie into both causes but does any do you or anybody else have I'll a, just, yeah, can I piggyback a little bit off of what you're saying find Start with your intimate relationships, people that you yeah. know, that also share your vision. Start putting the fillers out there. Find out 
someone that you know, if they can't open the doors for you, they may work for an organization that does. So I believe the goal is to find a lord, larger for-profit organization that shares your vision, that believes it. You're not, yes, you're gonna tell your story, that's excellent, but um, you don't wanna start from step one. If you find someone that also cares about what you care about, use that relationship then to help them you know, support your nonprofit. A lot of for-profit organizations are looking for nonprofit organizations to support because it gives them a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. So you are gonna create a win-win situation and sell it that way. I hate to say it that way, but that's what you're doing. Yeah. Sell it that way. So use your personal relationship. Start putting the fillers out there. Talking to your circle of friends about how passionate you are about your business and what you believe in. Someone knows someone. Use those relationships. Mm -hmm. Can you get me a, a meeting with your CEO? You know, start asking. And then you go in there and you tell them. You'd be surprised. There are a bunch of people out there that really want to help. They share your vision. They're going to want to help you advance that vision because they care about it as well. Just start the, the networking events. They're nice. I burnt myself out as mm -hmm. well. The first two years of my business, that was everyone. It was about coming back, hitting the reset button, and building from my relate my personal relationships. That's how I built this business. So that that's my advice to you. Great advice. Yeah, thank you. All right, we've got time for about two more quick questions. Uh, oh my goodness, we've got some more <laughs> Three questions. So, <laughs> thank, you so thank you so much. First of all, thank each one of you guys for coming tonight. I do appreciate it. Uh, each one of you has found some success in your field, and I'm curious as to who was the biggest influence or a mentor in your life? Great question. Wow. That's good. Great question. Start that who's, who's kicking that off? You start that off? Start that down there. That's good. Uh, um, I think, I'm, again, I may be kind of a, a, an anomaly, but uh, my brand is my life. My brand is that I have a mental illness and I faced a lot of discrimination and thought that I needed to sideline myself and I wasn't going to be able to be a therapist or be anything productive professionally because of it until I had a friend, uh, I've been grad school for counseling and I actually got a diagnosis uh, for an even worse mental illness and my faculty said, you're not going to really be able to be an effective caregiver, so maybe you should go to law school, maybe you should do this. My faculty said that, my counseling faculty said that to me and I, I came home and I was like, what on earth have I done? And my friend who had no idea about that conversation called me and she said, hey, I'm, she was getting her master's uh, in PR at the University of Georgia. She said, I really need to interview someone with a really, like, redemptive story and someone who's used adversity in their life uh, to, to give back to people. And so I want to interview you. And I was like, what? About what? She's like, you know, the way that you've, like, turned your mental health stuff into, you know, a, a way to give back to people. And that was the conversation that made me see, like, there's a need for me to champion this. And so I'm going to say more. Uh, you know, Giovanni knows her well. Uh, so uh, as far as mentors, I've had several, several, several people wanting to come along and help me out. But she was the one that was the catalyst for me. Uh, that first person was like, no, like the things that people are get, getting down on you for, they're actually important and you should follow them. Uh, so maybe not a traditional mentor at all, but uh, very, very crucial in my development. So this is gonna be simple, but it's true. But I'm gonna say my parents, to be honest with you. So my father immigrated to this country when he was 15 years old. And he actually left his family in Italy. He came to the US by himself. <laughs> And he stayed with my with his uncle um, at the age of 15. My mother came from severe poverty. She was one of nine children. Her father passed away when she was an infant, and she had two siblings also pass away of various ailments. The fact that they were able to accomplish what they were able to with nothing, I think, is a testament that it doesn't matter what you come from; it matters what your work ethic is. Yeah. I'm the first generation that not only went to college, graduated college, and I'm the first in my entire family to actually even graduate high school. Mm -hmm. And in a couple months, I'm gonna have a doctor title in front of my name. Nice. And coming, <laughs> now I that, it's just a testament of, I have a mother that came from poverty, and a father that is an immigrant, and just that love and that bond, I think that's a testament of faith. So that's why I look up to you. <laughs> um, gosh, mine's going to be, I hope this gets back to her because she's going to be so surprised that I say this. Um, 
Nine is actually Jennifer Stilwell, who runs Visit Greenville SC. And she's not, we, we met her through Leadership Greenville. Um, and I messaged her after meeting her and I was like, will you please mentor me? Um, Cause she's just amazing and brilliant. And is the person who came up with the, yeah, that Greenville campaign, trademarked it and just phenomenal. Um, so I was raised by a single mother. I have not one, but two special needs siblings. Um, we were also very much raised in poverty. Um, my mother was 20 years old when I was born, and the, my siblings, my special needs siblings, are twins, and they came less than two years later. Um, so I was kind of raised on an island. Um, there wasn't that emotional support. Um, I went to 10 different schools through 12th grade. Um, so I found some of my mentorships and a lot of my inspiration later on in life. So I just say that and share my story just to say if anyone else is struggling the same way, like keep fucking mm -hmm. going. It's okay, it will happen. Inspiration takes shape in many different forms and Jennifer is someone that we're both so busy, I probably only see four times a year but it's still been a really huge inspiration to me. So you also never know who you're inspiring. So I'm a full believer in, oh, y'all have chills. Um, I'm a full believer in putting good out into the world and staying true to your story and the rest just works itself out. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. I'm so <laughs> extremely emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an emotional person there, but I'm Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you, it, it's a very similar story to Giovanni and Leslie. My grandmother, um, extremely poor, Miss Fanny Jordan, um, in rural Louisiana, and me becoming a, an image consultant and then starting a professional development company started with her because even though she was extremely poor, my young mother was extremely poor, the thing that I got from my grandmother was, I don't care how poor you are, you show up like you belong. Yeah. And, 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 and she did use her appearance, her behavior behavior and communication skills. I didn't go back to college until I was 29 years old, but I was able to gain success because of my soft skills. I was able to get doors to open up for me because of those soft skills, appearance, behavior, and communication. And I'm telling you, I go back to Fanny Jordan. She was like, you know, you don't go out of the house um, without making sure your appearance looks a certain way. You, you, you speak a certain way. I don't care, and it just did not matter. She told, she said, tell us, if she had one dress or two dresses, she washed that dress and she, you know, you, know, you make yourself look presentable. And she, she was able, with an eighth grade education, to open doors for herself. So I took that and um, started. There it is, yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So mine's, <laughs> mine's the least beautiful and eloquent of all of these. <laughs> so, how perfect you are. <laughs> I, would, I would say early on in life, it was my grandmother who's been in you know, real estate since I was tiny and following around with her old briefcases and like bag funds. And then later in life, it sort of evolved into a collaboration of people that I respect and follow. Um, there are a few brokers around the country that are in the top 1% in the real estate world, uh, and they're in cool markets like uh, LA and New York and you know all these places doing these really cutting edge things. So I try to take from that and recreate it however I can in our market here and sort of follow what's working for them and you know kind of continue to be an innovator and trail, trailblazer on that front. Um, so that's like Gary Vaynerchuk. I think probably a lot of you are familiar with him. Uh, my videographer Jason's right there filming us today. So, if you know anything about Gary Vee, you know that uh, he doesn't go anywhere without a camera. So, we basically break up a bunch of video content and put it out on social. So, anybody looking for a videographer, that's your guy over here, Jason Ayers. Nice little plug. Um, so, yeah, Gary Vaynerchuk and just, um, you know, always just studying different influencers, people putting out content that really connects with me and trying to learn, you know, what they're doing well and what I can adapt for myself. Because in my personal, I'm going to the gym with my hair up, 
no makeup, and I'm very confident, happy, proud to show that for friends who will want to have a healthier lifestyle, but my brand is not anything fitness related. Um, I might have makeup professional pictures. How do I balance that as a new entrepreneur? Why is I'm going to give it to Leslie to give you the granular details on it, but I will say this. Your personal brand, who you really are, needs to start aligning with your business brand. That's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, and then Le Leslie's gonna take it deeper, but I'm gonna tell you, not going to the gym, I'm not gonna tell you to wear makeup to the gym, but I'm gonna tell you that it's time for you to um, make the changes that are necessary to align who you are personally with your professional brand so that you come across authentic. And get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, well, it, yeah, exactly. It, it, Exactly, get out of your comfort zone. That's even at that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and Jordan's exactly um, right about this. Um, this is one of the things in my personal brand that I do a lot. So I'm um, at Leslie F. Haas on Instagram if anyone wants to follow me to see a good example. But so you need to come up with a posting formula. So one of the things that I do with all my clients that goes through that social media playbook um, that I then g give to them is um, we think of your, we, we start with Instagram since that's the most um, visual platform, and we think of your posting in a grid of nine, because that's what usually what people are seeing as they're scrolling. Depending on the size of your screen, you might have 12, but nine is easier, so we'll just stick with that. Um, so, and I, 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 and stay with me because this is going to translate to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to all of them. So, um, say you have a wedding dress company. You also have um, fried face dresses. You also have jewelry, you also have mother of bride, you have everything else. So when someone comes to your social media page, you have six seconds, I think you said this statistic earlier, yeah, like it's like 6.4 or something, to capture someone's attention. The people are going to come to your page, read your bio, and they're going to scroll two to three times. So you <coughs> need to mathematically control what they're seeing and give them what they're looking for. So what I, so what I do, like I said, for all my clients is come up with a posting formula. So let's take the dress client, for example. They're primarily a, a wedding dress boutique, let's say. Um, so probably five to six out of every post needs to be about wedding dresses, right? Because if someone comes to their page, you scroll twice and you just see bridesmaids dresses, you're like, they don't have what I'm looking for. Which isn't true, we know that, but that's just what you're showing them. So break this down into a formula and it's gonna make it so much easier on yourself. So what, do you, what are the main three points that you need to be sharing about your business? Make that the bulk of your post. Throw one out of every nine as something personal, something you're up to, something that inspires you that day. Make it make sense, turn it into a math equation, and it's gonna be so much easier on you. And you can feel authentic without sharing too much. Um, this is also something that I concentrate on. All my social media is very authentic, but it's curated. I don't talk about my political opinions. I have my two special needs siblings, which, uh, which I touch on, but I don't share too much about out of respect for their privacy. Um, I have a boyfriend. He is not very, he's not very public and he's an introvert and doesn't want to be on my social media, which that's fine. So all these things, I'm not being inauthentic by not sharing them, so don't feel that way. It's just, it's okay to keep some things to yourself. Okay. You're welcome. Last question. Last question. Right here. Here you go. <laughs> you gave the wrong man the microphone. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> okay, so obviously I know Damien because we work together. But We're not going to claim that now. <laughs> anyway, my question is, is, does anybody use a third-party company for their social media posts? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, well, you are a third-party, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for me. Um, I uh, don't know if I want to give away what I'm currently using because that's some of my secret okay, sauce. Okay, um, but but yeah, I, I recommend those for, so I, so as a social media agency, I'm also an influencer and have a TV show and all this other stuff that goes on, but I swear it all feeds into each other. Um, so a lot of what I do is consulting with either larger businesses who maybe have a marketing firm, but they feel like they're not quite hitting it with social and they need some extra oomph. Or I do that like all the way down to, like I said, creating the social media playbook for a small business that maybe can't afford my full services, but that I still wanna help, right? So I very frequently um, 
recommend these platform these services for other people. So Hootsuite's a great one. Buffer is one. If you are um, really Instagram heavy and everything needs to look really pretty, like say you're a makeup artist or you're a therapist and you need to pro uh, you need to provoke a certain emotion as people are scrolling through your feed. Things like Plan, P-L-A-N-N, -N, are great, and Plan Oly, P-L-A-N-O-L-Y, are awesome for Instagram planning because they allow you to see a feed as you're creating it, which some of the heavy hitters like Buffer, Hootsuite, um, later are not doing. So okay. doing I, I, I use a platform called Social Pilot instead of Hootsuite because it allows you to do your own branding. I don't like Hootsuite, and I'm not sure from, I'm only familiar with Hootsuite. They all have their strengths. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they all suck for the yeah. most part. Yeah. None of them do everything that they're yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. They're all expensive. I mean, and just, I will you tell just you. have to find what works best for you. Yeah. Social Pilot is expensive. It's more expensive, I believe, than Hootsuite, but I did not want Hootsuite on my um, post. So with Social Pilot, where you'd see Hootsuite, you can actually put your own. So they see Red Door Consult. Anyone that sees a post, they see Red Door Consulting. Because I don't want people to think that I'm not the person that's interacting with them. I am busy. Um, I have an operations manager that helps with uh, marketing, but I have to sometimes use her um, support on other things. So it benefits me. On the first of the month, I get all of my posts schedule. I put them out there using social pilot. Now I do interact as much as I possibly can um, when people click on them. But it, it's beneficial to me for time management. It's okay. And let me clarify that white labeling like she's talking about is only really beneficial if you're working as an agency like myself. Mm -hmm. So one of the cons of using Hootsuite for me to manage other um, companies social media is that anyone who has admin rights to that account whenever a post is pushed out from Hootsuite, it's self-published by Hootsuite. Yeah. It doesn't show that to the general public. But so I have several clients who want to be natively post posted, which takes a lot more time, which they pay for that, um, because they believe bullshit, whatever, urban myths that it makes a difference. Um, so that white labeling does matter if you're an agency, and that's why. I mean, did you want to weigh in? Just from a more detached uh, lens, my my lead source number one is not is not Instagram, but outsourcing is your friend. If social media is going to be a pain point, cool, pay someone else to do it because it's going to be time value for money potential for you to pay a professional than to teach your like to learn all the things that you need to do to get yourself up to snuff with all of these. I don't want to read all those news letters. I don't want to keep up with the algorithm trends. I want to pay less money to do that. You know what I mean? So if you're a business where you're gonna, where you rely on heavy social media foot traffic, but you're like, man, it's gonna take me about six months to learn all this stuff, but I'm gonna save so much money out higher, higher performance. If it's gonna, you know, your energy is gonna be better used doing the things that you already know how to do well. Don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. There are people who know the wheel really, really well and are really good at using it. So like, just let them. And maybe that's a pride release. I don't really know, but uh, just kind of analyze. Uh, you know, someone was uh, my chiropractor was like, I really need to, to invest in. You know, equipment, but I need to pay for marketing. I'm like, hire influencer marketers. Like, find non-traditional marketing sources. Get some, get some soccer players. Get some people in here. There's probably, honestly, like, I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there, there are things that I don't know how to do that are out of my reach because I am younger. But then, like, flip the script. Like, is there someone on the converse end of things that probably knows things that are going to be a pain in the butt for you to work yourself up to? Cool maybe you can barter for services. Like I haven't paid for photography in years because I have so many friends that are photographers. And so they do my photography, but I help them with X, Y, Z. Like if revenue is, is a troublesome thing for you in that department, maybe there's a, you know, another way to handle that, but outsourcing, I love outsourcing. Absolutely, go through everything. Damien, I think you were itching to answer this question. Yes, but be careful when you're using a third party. I see a lot of people in my industry and then in some sales other arenas too um they'll just pay 35 dollars a month and this company will just post some generic nonsense on their facebook page every month or every two weeks or whatever they prescribe and there's nothing that chases away your follower faster than just seeing the same bland non-authentic stuff so just do some research make sure whatever your third party you're bringing in whether it's something automated or if it's an actual agency or uh, influencer to help, that they're gonna post relevant, authentic content that's gonna be good for you. Otherwise, you're just throwing you know, money away with something that's gonna be not getting you the attention and engagement that, that you need. Let's give a big round of applause for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>